Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first session of Columbia Energy Straight Talk. My name is David Hill, and I'm an adjunct uh, senior research scholar at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia SEPA. My good friend and Columbia colleague Cheryl LaFleur and I are very pleased to be hosting today's discussion. <clears throat> I think we've got more than, uh, well, I don't know how many, we've got several hundred people registered to attend. Um, this event is being webcast live and the full video will be available online in the coming days. <clears throat> Today we're going to be discussing what makes energy policy change successful. Energy and climate change are at the forefront of the public's mind these days, as I think everybody knows. President Biden has put these issues right at the top of his new administration's agenda. And uh, the recent cold weather and power outages in Texas and areas of the Midwest and South highlight the real world relevancy and importance of these issues. Cheryl and I came up with the idea for this discussion series because we thought that while energy and climate are at the top of the policy agenda, some of the discussion about those issues actually isn't all that great. A lot of the time it's not all that intelligent, just to be honest, um, and everybody kind of just argues their viewpoints rather than trying to get to a, a real forward thinking solution about some of the difficult problems today. We thought people might welcome the chance to hear and participate in a frank, practical, bipartisan discussion about energy, climate change, and related issues. And so that's what uh, we're going to try to do with Columbia Energy Straight Talk. For those of us, uh, for those of you joining us uh, via Zoom, you can submit a question for us at any time by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. For those of you watching the live stream anywhere else, you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag CJEP Live and the Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. With that, Cheryl, I will turn it over to you. Thanks very much, David. Now I really feel like the pressure is on because I think I've been a part of a lot of those past events that were not that great. So we have to make this one better. But I am Cheryl LaFleur. I'm a distinguished visiting fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy at Columbia, and I'm delighted to co-host this event and have all of you here. Um, as David said, we all recognize that the nation's energy system is at an inflection point as we wrestle with how to adapt it to climate goals. And that transformation is surely gonna to lead to a lot of changes in market rules, transmission rules, reliability standards, but there's very little consensus on what changes to make and a very disaggregated structure of federal and state agencies and elected officials making the rules. The events in Texas just this past week certainly highlight the importance of getting the rules right, as well as the prevalence of political disagreements about how to do it. David and I thought we'd start off these sessions by harking back to a time of successful change in energy policy, looking at changes that worked, how they happened, and why they endured. And we're really fortunate to have as our first guest, Chair Betsy Moeller. Betsy is a nationally recognized energy expert. She served as a commissioner of FERC from 1988 to 1997 and as chair of the commission from 1993 to 1997. She was the first FERC chair I ever knew personally. So I consider her a personal role model that I try to live up to. She also served as deputy secretary and acting secretary of energy during the Clinton administration. At other stages of her career, she worked on the Hill in Senate Energy and Natural Resources and as a leader in the private sector as Exelon until her retirement in 2010. So she's either been center stage or had a front row seat for several decades of energy policy. Welcome, Betsy. I think I'd like to start with Order 888, which I know is one of your signature achievements. And when we set this up, we didn't realize that it's just about 25 years this April since the issuance of that landmark order, which really transformed the nation's transmission grid and led the way to wholesale competitive markets and electricity. I know you obviously spearheaded the role as chair of FERC, but it seems so huge now to get something like that done in a bipartisan way. Can you tell us a little bit about how it came about, how you came up with the idea, convince people that it was needed, and, and just how did you actually make it happen? And we will try to learn from that. There we go. Sorry about that. 
Um, thank you, Cheryl, for that generous introduction. I appreciate your invitation to join you today for the inaugural session of the Columbia Energy Straight Talk, uh, What Makes Policy Change Successful? I hope this can be an informal uh, discussion. That's my nature. I plan to share my perspective on my time at the Federal Energy Re Regulatory Commission, also known as FERC, with particular emphasis on the landmark rulemaking we undertook to require FERC regulated electric utilities to provide open access to their transmission lines. I will admit I'm proud of our success. As Cheryl noticed, I served at FERC from 1988 until 1997. President Clinton designated me as the chair of FERC. That was before non-sexist titles were the norm. There were lots of furniture jokes at the time. I had four wonderful, extraordinary colleagues during my tenure as chair. Vicki Bailey, Jim Hecker, Bill Massey, and Don Santa. The press dubbed us as the dream team, so there were some pretty lofty hopes and expectations. It may surprise you that at the time, political jobs didn't come with a lot of guidance for what you were expected to do. That was simultaneously exciting and overwhelming. Fortunately, when I became the chair, I had been at the commission for about four years, so I'd gotten the hang of the place. I chose a very talented, dear friend as my general counsel, Susan Tomaski, and off we went. Our major undertaking was developing, issuing, revising, and defending Order 888. As an aside, I will uh, note that the order was designated 888 because that was the address of the then new FERC headquarters at 888 First Street Northeast. I take pride in both the building and the regulatory initiative. Electric markets in the United States were in transition. Traditional electric utilities and non-traditional market players, including generators, traders, environmentalists, and other public interest groups had all become involved in FERC proceedings. Change was in the air and we had to figure out what to do. We undertook a series of public listening sessions, opened a docket seeking comments about what we should do, and then jumped off the regulatory cliff. We went through the required public comments, had both paper and in-person uh, listening sessions, paper hearings, excuse me, and in-person listening sessions. Then we screwed up our courage and issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, otherwise known as a NOPER. It was pretty heavy stuff at the time. It was widely covered in the trade press and in the popular press, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and others. I don't recall that it made any evening news programs. I would put you to sleep if I tried to recapture the myriad public comments, technical comments, technical conferences, and other regulatory proceedings. Suffice it to say, they were extensive. Ultimately, we developed a consensus among the commissioners and our staff on what we should do. We unanimously issued a final rule and thus codified a sea change in the regulatory environment for one of our nation's critical industries. The industry complied. They didn't have much of a choice. Some were enthusiastic, others not so much. Pretty crazy? Yes, indeed. The open access requirements were successfully implemented. I should note that they were, of course, challenged in court. The leading case went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States. I retended the oral arguments. FERC's initiative was affirmed. Years later, about 25, I admit to being proud of our successful efforts. One of the amazing privileges of public service is feeling like you made a difference and did your job well. I don't toot my horn often, but I definitely feel that the five of us at FERC, plus our amazing staff, lived up to the challenge of public service and did our job well. Thanks to Cheryl and to all of you for letting me reminisce. So Betsy, um, when you were uh, the chair there in the 90s, uh, the middle 90s, I was actually just getting started on uh, my uh, life in the electricity sector. And I, and you know, it's, of course, back then there was no internet um, there, uh, or at least no internet most people could use. I mean, my kids actually say, you know, I don't even know how people live before the internet. And, you know, now I remember reading the, uh, the order list that would come out from FERC and, you know, thumbing through the CCH, trying to find uh, various precedent. I mean, you, you mentioned about public listening sessions and, and the commission sort of thinking about what it wanted to do. 
I mean, how did you decide how far to go in that rule? I mean, how, how I mean, it was such a sea change in yeah, the, in the mm -hmm. industry and it's not like everybody agree and it's not like everybody, yeah. all the industry groups per, uh, or participants were agreeing on everything. I mean, how was it you and your colleagues decided just how, how far you wanted to go in that rule? Well, I think with the onslaught of discussions, public discussions, private discussions, um, hearings, uh, both uh, in person and paper hearings, as they're called, um, it just became obvious that um, in order to break this, the uh, stranglehold that the incumbent uh, electric utilities had on providing the service, we had to do something pretty dramatic. And there were lots of uh, players, uh, generators uh, in particular, and also uh, utilities that were interested in providing uh, more services than they had than uh, they were allowed to do under at the exist under the existing law. We uh, did an environmental impact statement. Uh, we thought about what we wanted to do. Um, and then just screwed up our courage and said, okay, we'll try this. And we really didn't know what kind of um, reaction to expect. Uh, some, some of the industry participants were horrified. Um, some were wildly enthusiastic. But overall, I think we had the feeling that we had, you know, tried to hit something down the center of the road and um, had achieved that. Uh, the the uh, the whole regulatory process infor informed us a tremendous amount. We made lots of changes and then screwed up our courage and did the final rule. Okay. Can I ask you just one follow up on that? You mentioned that uh, that the challenge, of course, it was challenged in the courts, and and in the end, the the challenges went all the way to the United States. I, if, if I remember right, the the case actually was New York against FERC. In the end, the um, uh, decided maybe five or six years after um, Order 888 was issued, when you were putting together the rule, I mean, you had to know it was gonna be challenged in court. And, it, and, and how, how much did that play into your, your thinking about what you wanted to do, about what you, how you approached things, the fact that you knew it was gonna get litigated and challenged? Well, virtually everything the commission issues uh, gets litigated and challenged. Cheryl can speak to that as well from her time at the commission. So it was just a given that that was going to be true. And what we tried to do was balance the equities. And um, there were lots of generators who were interested in serving customers directly. Uh, we thought that the competition that they would um, provide to the incumbent um, uh, utilities would be healthy. Um, and the uh, record that we developed certainly amply supported that theory. Uh, and fortunately, it proved to be true in practice as well. Betsy, I remember it so well. Um, I was young in the, well, not that young, but actually <laughs> a full adult, but I was in the industry and I remember um, being terrified after the so-called mega noper and what the, all the rumors of what FERC was going to do. And in my memory, I'm standing at a dot matrix printer, pulling off the, all the hundreds of pages one at a time to see what, this, what the world was going to look like. I want to focus on how you got consensus on the commission. Um, it was a unanimous bipartisan order, which surely has something to do with its enduring nature. And we got a question in the Q&A on like, what were your colleagues like? Were they ideological? Were they from the private sector and going back to the private sector? Or, you know, if you could comment a little bit on, you know, every FERC has its own, every set of five people has its own kind of personality and gelling and how you made, how you all made that happen and what kind of people you know, because of, I think we've seen ideological and partisanship ebb and flow at FERC, and it's it's always a little disappointing when it flows, if that's the one that means <laughs> or ebbs. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it, it's funny. I, uh, we had both Democrats and Republicans on the commission. That is required by law. You can't have um, all uh, one party. It's required to be bipartisan. Um, and from uh, Bill Massey and Don Santa, for example, uh, were from 
the Hill. Uh, they had worked um, for uh, on the in the Senate. Uh, Bill a Democrat, Donna a Republican. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And we just uh, sat and listened and talked among ourselves, and the a process was very um, iterative. I guess would be the 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 word that one would use now, and talked about how what what we could do that had a chance of of uh, being confirmed affirmed excuse me um, that would make a difference um, in the um, industry and I, I think the fact that there were a lot of new uh, uh, generation wannabe generation builders who were anxious to have a market for their power other than just to the incumbent electric utilities was a very very, very um, important uh, driver of our efforts. And once we realized that that is what we needed to accomplish, the only way we could do it uh, was to open up the transmission lines and make it make it possible. I mean, Betsy, after the there, you 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 had a number of. Uh, I mean, I guess would it, did uh, Jim and and uh, and Don and um, did ever. Did everybody join the commission? You were you went on the commission in 1988. Is that is that right? Is that what you said? I think so. <laughs> the, <laughs> Time yeah. flies when you're having fun. Right. I'd have, and then, to, I'd but, have to look it up to tell you the truth. <laughs> but, but you had a lot of uh, you you had uh, a number of new commissioners that joined shortly after President Clinton was elected there in 1993 uh, or 1992, right. and then took office in 93. So you had you had kind of a new commission. I mean, and of course you were designated as chair. So you were, you had a, um, you all of a sudden were, uh, you'd been on the commission a while, but now you were the chair, which is a completely different role to play. Um, yes, it is. And, and so in, in some respects, you, you had kind of a new commission, you certainly had a new role. Um, and that's a little bit analogous to what we have down there at FERC now, where Rich Glick has been on, uh, of course, been on the commission a number of years now uh, and, and has dissented regularly, obviously. Um, but now all of a sudden is the chair setting the agenda um, and so forth. I mean, something that both the, you and Cheryl have had experience do, doing, of course, as chairs. Um, how did you kind of approach the kind of um, trying to get the the body of the commissioners to work together towards consensus i mean was it through these listening sessions or do you think it really had to do with were you able to do that in part because of the personality of of the folks who were your colleagues or what do you what do you think were some of the keys to your success uh, in doing that you know david i i don't know that i really thought a whole heck of a lot about it at the time uh, but I think just in the back of my of my brain, I had learned an awful lot by being a staff person for the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And I had worked for uh, Senator Henry M. Scoop Jackson, who was a masterful, uh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man and a masterful politician. And Senator J. Bennett Johnston from Louisiana, from a producing state. And I had watched them just work with their colleagues and work with the staff, uh, hold public hearings, et cetera. The whole, the whole mechanism uh, that um, uh, the Senate affords people who take it seriously and aren't just showboats. And I think I, that was just sort of part of my being by the time I got to the commission. And I think I absorbed it uh, even more as I spent years at the commission before I became the chair. And so it was just part of my DNA at that point. Oh, Cheryl, that's sort of a question for you too. I mean, you know, just in yeah. your in your role as as chair, how you approached that and kind of thought about that. Well, I also had the fortunate experience of being um, commissioner before I was chair. Although my chairmanship was kind of funky. First, I was made acting chair on like forty five minutes notice, uh, <laughs> and then was chair for a while, then not chair, then acting chair again. But I think I understood how commissioners think. And of course, FERC has a Sunshine Act rule. So it's not like any normal company you've ever worked for where if there's a big problem, you just all get in a room and get some you know, coffee or wine and kick it around for as long until you get a consensus. You have to talk one-on-one -on -one with everyone. But I, I think I, I think it helped in my case that I'm 
so I, a little bit of a left centrist anyway. I never was driven to the most, not usually wasn't driven to the most extreme. And so I tried to start there and see if we could get people on both sides. Because I do think that the, when I think of the orders that have worked, I mean, order 745, the demand response order all, also went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And it was really interesting to me that a compromise I made with Mark Spitzer to kind of, um, on the to protect customers on the net benefits test, which was a geeky little thing we added to the rule, was actually mentioned by the Supreme Court in upholding the rule, as was the fact that we didn't go all the way in taking over state jurisdiction. So some, you know, I'm a believer if you're a little more incremental, sometimes things last longer. But, you know, I know that's not necessarily the view today where there's a sense of like impending doom and we must go as fast as we can. Hey, Bet Betsy, there was a question in the in the chat about uh, Scoop Jackson, uh, about Senator Jackson. I mean, and you, you mentioned about him being a, a master. I mean, what is it that, that uh, from your perspective, that made him a master there in the Senate in terms of being able to uh, to make make policy change and be successful there? Because I think we would all say, well, you know, there might be some in Congress that would be that, there might be some that wouldn't be that. I mean, what was it about him that, uh, that, that would make you characterize him that way? Well, at the time, the Congress was a very, very, very different place than it is now. It didn't have 24-7 uh, news coverage. Uh, meetings were not um, televised. Um, you could literally go in the back room and cut deals. There weren't lots of, of um, norms that precluded people from just uh, working through issues. And I think that uh, uh, both from Scoop, who of course was, at the, was known more for his hawkish um, uh, views on foreign policy uh, than he was for his accomplishments at the Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and then uh, Bennett Johnson, of course, was from an oil and gas producing state, Louisiana. And uh, both of them just wanted to do things. They wanted to accomplish things. Their goal was not um, uh, self-aggrandizement. It was they were there to do the job. And I just think that became a part of, of, of my DNA. And I will say um, Bill Massey got it from uh, working for Senator Dale Bumpers from Arkansas and, and Don had it as well. So we, we were just that was just the way we were um, um, we were raised, as it were. There was an interesting question in the chat about, uh, you know, in 1996, we were opening up the transmission grid to Wheeling. And of course, we might come on to this, but the next step we tried to take in order number two, in order number 1000 was open transmission development to competition, which has been a mixed success at best. Right. Uh, are we ready to open distribution to competition with all the um, behind the meter storage and solar and other providers? You know, that's New York tried to do that with setting up the distribution system operators that were somewhat analogous to the independent system operators that FERC set up. And in some ways, I think the I mean, I was at FERC when we tried to put out the distributed, we put out the distributed storage, the first rule. And in some ways, I think the incumbent utilities are even more protective because they're saying, wait, you're taking away distribution. This is all we have left. You took away Excuse generation uh, in many parts <laughs> of the country. And then now transmission, you have all these rules around it, what we have to do with it and distribution, that's like our thing. But clearly the next generation of technologies might be quite localized. I don't know if either of you have a thought on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I claim absolutely no expertise <laughs> on, on distribution. Um, I think that is more likely to be a natural monopoly and likely to remain so just because of the physical nature of the facilities involved. I don't, um, I, I could be very wrong about that, but I, there hasn't been a big push for it that I'm aware of. And it, it just doesn't seem to be a thing. I don't think anyone wants to share the wires. I mean, I do think there's very, there's not seen to be a lot of um, 
benefit to customers to opening up the wires per se and letting other people build them. Um, that's not a high margin game anyway. But it's the, not fun or easy either. But the <laughs> um, allowing distribution connected storage and solar and other things and allowing community solar to wheel across and so forth does seem to be something that there's a lot of people knocking on the door to do. I think David, you had your mic off, so. Well, I mean, it's a really interesting question. I, I think yeah, that it is, it is it, in some respects, it it, uh, it 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 provides an interesting analogy to what I think happened in the 90s and kind of leading up to Order 888-96. And if you think about that process then, there were sort of, and, and, and the Betsy's leadership there at FERC and what led to Order 888, well, you know, when you think about it, Congress had actually in the 92 Energy Policy Act had done had taken some steps to try to uh, prevent, and they had amended the Federal Power Act. They kind of tiptoed their way into certain kinds of open access and, you know, and that would require all this proceeding at FERC. I mean, really a totally and completely unworkable set of, of <laughs> processes really. Um, but it was sort of like it was, and there was, there was a lot of dissatisfaction with some of the, the generation decisions that had been made as a result of the the centrally planned systems and of course we you know the experience with the, the overbuilding or the nukes and things like that back in the 80s so it was one of these things where the there was kind of this whole lead up i mean i think at the at the this point it's kind of where we've got we do have a lot of innovative technologies um we have a lot of uh, a, a lot of and in fact, the kind of the Texas situation sort of points out, well, should we be thinking about more things on the distributed side of things or what kind of what can we do on the demand side or the more consumer control? I do think that, that it's something where there's there, there is a, an opportunity for some careful thinking about what is it? What is really the, the monopoly product and what is it that, that could be um, competitive and what is the right thing for in what way to to allow competitive access. I mean, I think it's uh, it could be an interesting area of inquiry. I think it is an interesting area of inquiry. Of course, you would have, um, you don't have a central entity that could, could sort of grab hold of the issue and implement it. You'd have uh, 50 states plus the District of Columbia experimenting. And I'm sure it would be quite a, uh, quite a hodgepodge. Well, and enormous. I think, and of course, that's true now with the with the incumbent service providers. But I, I don't have a sense that there's a um, a huge. I I don't smell the money. <laughs> the way to put it, I, I don't I don't see the big uh, economic benefits of doing so. But I could be absolutely wrong. Well, Cheryl, I was going to go ask you a question about okay. Order One Thousand, okay. but. Uh... There, uh, that, that sort of uh, sort Maybe of. Maybe ask that, and I was going to take a question in the chat and combine it with one of our pre-questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, how about if I ask you an order one thousand? Okay, I'm ready. I'm what? ready to defend. I'm not a hundred percent proud as Betsy, but it's still my order. Well, 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 you know. So the when we think about landmark orders. I mean, of course, Order 1000 was one as well. I will say, you know, maybe not, uh, not, not, not as uh, uh, arguably not as not as impactful as uh, as Order 888. But um, but you know, you were there at uh, at the commission and as a part of Order 1000. I mean, what what was your what what were your objectives? I mean, and and how is it that you kind of approached the very same process that Betsy was was talking about? Was, you was doing Order 1000. Well, uh, we did think it was a landmark. I mean, I bought a new dress on the day that we had the open meeting. Uh, our chairman, John Wellingoff, had his children in the front row. And I think similar to the background of Order 888, we observed changes happening in the industry and the, um, the laws that we had in place had not fully kept up with them, which relates to a question in the chat of can FERC keep up with change? It's hard because of the pace of doing the rulemaking. And so we believe that the changing grid would require a lot more high voltage and long distance transition, especially to 
transmission, especially to connect location constrained renewables. And I actually think that's even more true now than it was 10 years ago this year when we did order 1000. And we thought that in order to keep the rates just and reasonable for customers, the transmission should be planned on as broad a geography as possible and with a fair process to decide who paid. Because we'd had some court cases about transmission cost allocation really questioning what was fair. And we really thought we were building on the legacy of 888 and 890, and this was the next one, and then there'd be one after that that would maybe tackle into regional transmission a little in a more muscular way. And there were two parts of the rule. One was a new process for planning and cost allocation of transmission within regions that applied to both organized markets and bilateral market regions and coordination between the regions. And then the second was um, a requirement of competition that a transmission company couldn't just have a right of re first refusal to be the incumbent and build everything in their distribution footprint, that big projects had to be bid out by the regional planning entities to decide who would be the best one, the cheapest and the most cost effective way to build it. And Unlike order 888, which had a lot of carrots for the utilities with the stranded cost they were going to get if they went along with the new world, order 1000 actually had more sticks in requiring <laughs> competition. And I think that um, I, I thought at the time, but not forcefully enough. And I think now we probably would have been better off just going forward with the planning and cost allocation rule. And maybe we would have gotten further because the competition part of it just was so opposed by the incumbents and it became so difficult to get anything um, really done in that area that it actually undermined other parts of the rule, I think. And although this has been a mixed success, there's been some transmission built, none in the non-RTO regions as a result of Order 1000. Every region has had at least one competitive bidding process, but it, it hasn't had the impact we hoped it would. And I think it's time for a relook. Time well, for the next big round number order to come out of the new FERC and see what they can do. Betsy, any, any thoughts about that? I'm sorry, you're outside my area of expertise. So I, I, I don't really, um, I, I do think having, having worked for uh, Exelon for a long time, um, and they have, of course, uh, distribution systems, own distribution systems in a, a number of large cities, the, the idea of competition among distribution systems is, pretty foreign to me. Now, of course, competition was foreign for generators too, and I understand that. But I, I think because of the whole, whole question of building, uh, particularly, uh, it's particularly difficult in urban areas, I, I think it's a lot harder not to crack. Cheryl, let me ask you one follow-up question on 1000, uh, Order 1000. I, you, you made some comments about, you know, hadn't been as successful as, as, uh, as you and your colleagues at the commission were hoping at the time. The, and it, it seems as if the, the, the current commission, uh, Chairman Glick and others might be uh, focused on taking a look at that. I mean, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts about what the kind of the objectives if uh, in terms of an order 1000 relook ought to be? Well, we started a docket at when I was still on the commission, actually nearly five, four or five years ago and took some, um, had a tech conference, took some material on what was and wasn't working. And there was a lot of discussion at that time of maybe um, more flexibility around the cost allocation rules, being less categorical about what went into one category of the rule or not, maybe more clarity of what was or was not um, had to be bid out, did or did not have to be bid out since the regions were kind of, not the regions, but the incumbents were trying to find ways to do things that didn't have to be bid out. And I think, when I think back, there were really two objectives of Order 1000. One was to get more transmission built through the planning and cost allocation rules. And the second was to introduce competition in who got to build that transmission. Um, not in distribution, but who got to build the big transmission projects. And the second was very important to Chairman John Willinghoff. It seems the current commission is very, very climate leaning. And if building transmission is their top thing, they might want to focus on that part of the rule and strengthen 
get do the things that's going to make it easier to build transition, maybe with a little more carrots of what you get if you build the kind of transmission they want, rather than not abandon. They can't, they've already won court cases on the other part of the rule. They can't like junk it, but maybe emphasize more the part of the rule that'll help transmission get built. And I would not be surprised to see them go in that direction because we're going to need a lot more transmission to even begin to meet the 24 state climate goals and the Biden administration aspirations. Oops, sorry, um, hit the wrong button there. Uh, what One question we, we have in the chat is transparency, the issue of transparency. Um, you touched upon this a little bit, Betsy, just in terms of working with your colleagues, but what how much, uh, I mean, these are incredibly tough issues. If we think about some of the, both both the issues when Order 88 was happening, when Order 1000 was happening, as well as a number of the, the, the energy transition issues today, climate issues, climate uh, uh, issues being very controversial and anything, uh, anytime anybody mentions climate or climate action. And um, in, in terms of regulatory action that is gonna address this, how important is it that the decision-making process be transparent and how, how important is it to you, or the regulatory process or how, how much do you think is okay that it's like, well, look, this is controversial and folks just need to kind of get in a room and work it out and then <laughs> present, present to everybody what, what the answer is and everybody just needs to kind of live with. Well, I think the nature of the process means that a lot of the work is going to be transparent. I mean, from uh, dockets, notice and comment rulemaking processes, public hearings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of those uh, nuts and bolts of uh, the various acts that uh, govern the commission mean the process has to be transparent. And I also think that the commission and the staff learn a lot um, as, as, you, as you go through that process. If not, you, you're asleep at a switch or something like that. But I, I think that the, the nature of uh, the process means that, that um, if you're careful about it, you have some uh, hope of, of success. And I think that's uh, vitally important in terms of uh, the uh, various actors' willingness to, to live with the result. I also I has to, I have to have a sense that it's fair. Um, and then I also don't underestimate the importance of smelling the money. I mean, in 888, it was recovery stranded costs. I mean, it was bald. And um, I, I think that uh, the, the industry players will we'll understand that and certainly help people figure that out. Well, one thing that I do think is important on stranded costs is the, the in, in order 888, and I, and I do think the way that, that you dealt with this is really interesting. You didn't say everybody gets stranded cost recovery. What you said is you have an opportunity to go try to seek your stranded costs. Um, and so it was, it, it really sort of walked down. And the, the, the reason I know this uh, well is because I actually represented the parties in some, one of the very first stranded, maybe I think it may have been the first stranded cost case where we were trying to uh, apply what it was that was in order 888. And it was one of these things where it, it uh, there were things that had to be proven, of course. There were issues that had to be worked out, and but it was the opportunity to go uh, to go make a case is what you what was provided there. Well, yeah, and, and it's just funny. This from the back of my of my adult brain comes the phrase legitimate, prudent, verifiable stranded costs. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't just say, okay, I think I'm should be reimbursed a million bucks. You had to to show that what actually happened as a result of uh, the regulatory proceeding. And um, I, I don't think I would argue against that standard in the, in the present day. I think it's important to have the notion of some incentive to be sure, but also legitimate. We had a question in the chat um, from my old friend, Mike Jasanis about the relationship <laughs> between federal policy and state policy. And of course, that's always been a hot button and it is really 
right now. And his specific question is, is there scope for more federal leadership on some of the climate and energy issues? Um, and it, it just about when I was, at, I'll just take the first crack. When I was at FERC, I was mindful that just about everything we touched was also regulated at the state level. And certainly right now there's a lot of tensions because a lot of the climate leadership is being done at the state level and the regions are um, working hard to adapt their markets that are FERC regulated to keep up with some of the state initiatives. But I do think on some of these big macro problems, there is scope for more federal leadership. Um, I think that a federal climate goal, I, if I could fantasize that we had had a consensus climate goal come out of Congress, that was the law, <laughs> even if it wasn't all the way to where we wanted, you know, where some people wanted it to be, then the other states could work within that the way they do within the Clean Air Act, where they can go further, but you'd have an overarching structure like some countries do. And right now, this isn't my area of expertise, but we see on the vaccines and on the pandemic that letting all the states do something different, sometimes there's a reason why the doing something on a national level is better, but we have a very complicated structure in our country, and it's very hard to find things that the federal government does does that the states don't also do. And I don't know, you must have had a lot of federal state issues. They're, they're in everything FERC does, Betsy. They are. Um, I think um, it hasn't gotten any easier. Indeed, I would submit that it's gotten a whole lot harder. Um, and I, I think the whole um, leadership issue is really important. I mean, if, you know, newly confirmed Secretary Granholm wants to undertake that, great. I kind of doubt it's at the top of, of, of her uh, to-do list, but um, it, it's, it's hard to, for me to think of an overarching federal policy that would somehow redound to success at the state level in, in that regard. You know, when it comes to that, I mean, I do think that there's, and actually I'd put some comments on in the, in on the FERC carbon pricing uh, policy docket about this. I mean, I, I think there are ways where the, the there can be state leadership and on some of these things, and it can be accommodated through FERC mechanisms. I mean, you know, it seems to me that, that the FERC can either try, FERC and the states can either try hard not to get along, or they can try hard to get along. Um, and it's sort of hard work <laughs> either way, um, but you know, I'd actually suggest trying hard to get along. Um, and it, and it, and, and particularly from the perspective of uh, building things, if we're trying to put capital to work, if we're trying to actually build new technologies, if we're trying to actually allow uh, innovators to to build stuff, uh, new new technologies to be deployed. Um, Having having a clearer set of, uh, of of market rules and at least having uh, some coordination between and it does seem to me it's not it's not impossible for, for and carbon pricing is actually one where it seems to me like it's perfectly possible for that to to happen through uh, through um, the FERC tariffs and through a carbon pricing policy if, if FERC and uh, one and could accommodate what the state policies are. We had a question in the chat, surprise, surprise, on Texas, because there's a law now <laughs> that you have to talk about Texas every hour. Um, and But all kidding aside, uh, David, we've talked a lot about FERC, but you were an, a pretty senior official at the Department of Energy when the 2003 blackout happened, and which of course led to a lot of change that's still with us in the way we regulate reliability and so forth. And I wonder if there are parallels to what the Department of Energy did in that case um, and what we're looking at in Texas. Maybe that's an entree into that topic. Yeah, no, th thanks, Cheryl. I mean, you know, after, I, I remember that day that that happened, I, I remember right, it was in the middle of August of 03, and I, I, I actually walked up to um, the post office. I don't know when people actually still went to the post office back in, uh, up at LaFont Plaza, and I was there at the Department of Energy, and I was walking back downtown, or walking back down the road, and walked into the building, and walked back up to the general counsel's office, and they said, um, there's been some things that have happened. I think you need to go down to the emergency <laughs> operations center. And, um, and I, but, but I think immediately after that, the, um, 
and of course that that night was uh was was quite an experience but there really was an effort put for secretary abraham led this at doe and along with a, a, a canadian counterparts because it was as everybody who was around then remembers i mean the blackout affected both the united states and canada i mean there was a there was really a high level group put together really with the idea that uh, and with real experts um Allison Silverstein Jimmy Glotfelty many many others who uh who participated in in um helping coordinate it and then trying to um to to really get to the bottom the root causes of what what really happened and producing an authoritative report and you know DOE has in incredibly powerful information collection authorities mm -hmm. that, that are not in any way limited by the, uh, you know, they don't stop at the border of Texas. Right, right. Um, and so the, the authorities are very powerful and, and under certain circumstances can, can actually give really rock solid confidentiality to data as well, if that's what, uh, if, if that's where they want to go with it. And I, I guess I think the, the good thing about having DOE take part of that role is it's not the economic regulator. I mean, one of the, the problems after an event like this is that some of the time everybody, everybody wants to do their inquiry and everybody kind of proceeds to their, their own corner of defending whatever it was that their role was in something that might've had, a, uh, might've been a cause of it of some kind. I mean, DOE not being the economic regulator, it just seems to me it could play a, play a good um, uh, role in helping get to the bottom of, of uh, both the causes and then actually really Id helping identify what some actual solutions are. I mean, I have my, I have my own ideas about that, but I think uh, there are some real experts in sort of what the uh, identifying what, what, what the amount of better forecasting, weatherization standards, through, through uh, whether through permitting and, or through market incentives. I mean, there, there are various things that can be, be uh, what should be done on the demand side? Um, what should be done on efficiency? There are a lot of things that could be done that could have helped both mitigate this situation and help prevent the next one. You know, DOE is such a wide ranging um, entity and wide ranging authority. Fundamentally though, DOE is bombs and R&D. And those are their two the two principal missions of, of the department. Of course, they've got a lot of really smart people. They've got the national labs that can do great work, but it's what, what you're talking about, I don't think has had uh, any particular um, emphasis or, or focus. Now, maybe um, Texas inspired events, to, to use a, a sort of a, probably an inappropriate phrase, uh, may uh, cause them to look at some of these things, or, but I don't know. I they have the authority to do it, I agree. And they also have really good uh, um, numerical skills. Whether it's DOE or not, and I think they did a great job in 2003 because people still cite the blackout report all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree. Whether it's DOE or not, I think it's important. There's so many aspects of Texas that we need to get to the bottom of. You know, what happened yeah. with the markets? Um, what, what about the distribution rules and people's retail signups? Um, FERC has already started an investigation with NERC of the weatherization and the reliability standards. So that part will be done, but there's a lot that's not within FERC's authority because it's within Texas. And I think it there's lessons to be learned for the other regions of the country, both in market design, because otherwise people will cite this as a market failure the way they cite the 2001 California market collapse. Yeah. Like, oh, look, markets don't work. That's a reason if we don't actually figure it all out, as well as other regions also have climate adaptation needs, whether they're from heat, cold, hurricanes, and are going to face more and more severe events. So I think there's a lot we have to learn. And I hope the federal government can play a role. I know Texas will you know, the PUC and so forth, I assume we'll do a lot of work on it, but I think there's a lot to be learned. Cheryl, <laughs> one, uh, one question in, in the chat, and um, I, you may want to address this, is uh, what the, that Congress actually in, uh, in the 2005 Energy Policy Act did enact some new authorities with the intention of, of really kind of incentivizing or enabling the development of some new transmission. Um, through the national interest corridor, interest electric transmission corridors, and of course with the ability of 
FERC to then uh, permit a, a line within one of those corridors, as well as the third party finance authority. And yet, for various reasons, it hasn't amounted to very much. I mean, do you have thoughts about uh, the the potential for for reinvigorating the, those authorities or making making uh, the, how the new Biden administration could really make use of them to to help build new transmission? I'll answer that and then pivot to another question in the that came in the Q and A. I think we know why the backstop transmission siding was stillborn. It was because of two circuit court cases, one in the fourth circuit that re redefined what it meant for a state to say no, and basically said <laughs> a state could say no as long, they only just couldn't take too much time. As long as they follow their schedule, they were allowed to say no and FERC couldn't step in. So that kind of undercut a lot of the rule. And then FERC was figuring out if there was a way to deal with that when the Ninth Circuit issued a case basically saying the whole way the DOE had been designated corridors was wrong. And so the thing kind of just atrophied. And uh, I've testified, I don't know, how many times have I testified? Every time I've testified, I've said, the most important thing FERC can do is reinvigorate backstop transmission siting. Um, but I know there is a way for, there's a recent paper published out of Columbia and NYU that suggested that FERC could reissue backstop siting rules find somebody who was willing to bring up a case not in the Fourth Circuit, get the DOE <laughs> to redesignate a corridor and find another test case and try to bring it to the Supreme Court. I think that's a multi-year effort that would require a very trusting investor to be the test case. But I mean, it is a way to do it. But that gets to the question I was going to answer, which is what should be done by FERC as an independent agency and what should be done by Congress. Um, it seems like there's times when, I, I at least feel it would be better for Congress to act, but that's just very difficult. So FERC dusts off its 70 year old rules and does its best just like the EPA does with its 50 year old rules. And um, do you have any thoughts, Betsy, on you know this independent agency model? It, there's really good parts about it. Are we pushing too much through it in places where Congress should act or, or, or David, you know, how, how do we think about this? Because we don't seem to be getting a lot of energy legislation. It seems like mm -hmm. FERC and the agencies are just figure muddling through with what we have. And then the courts just slap them down if they don't do it right. And, you know. Cheryl, I don't know that I have any particular uh, expertise to add to that. I, I haven't um, uh, thought about it a whole lot. I, I do think that the whole Texas experience is going to uh, be a, a focus of uh, discussion, um, both good and bad. Um, I'm hoping that we're not going to just blame the blackouts on solar and wind, wind energy like the governor did. Of course, those, those players were not major in the, in the state's uh, emergency plan, but I'm, I'm, I don't have any particular insights to add, I'm afraid, I'm sorry. Well, you know, maybe, maybe you do. Never let a good crisis go to waste. So it was San Bruno <laughs> that led to the Pipeline Safety Act, and it was the 2003 blackout that led to the 2005 Energy Policy Act. That's I don't true. know if this is big enough to lead, lead to an act. I, I mean, one thing that I think in response to your question, Cheryl, you know, it's, it's it's interesting that so much um, change authority is, is or, or or really authority and ability to bring about change, and not just in the energy sector, but in in other sectors, in telecom, um, in in, a, in other sectors, comes out of the independent agencies. Um, and I think the there's just structurally the fact that the independent agencies. Um, they, they have expert staffs, they, they, have, uh, they, they have the ability to really focus on a particular area, they take action with really knowledge of the, the, the industry, um, and of course the rules are challenged, you know, under the Administrative Procedure Act or, or could be NEPA or various things, um, but, the, but there's, in terms of their rulings and so forth, but the, there's, I, I think the, 
there really is the the kind of the ability to bring about change there that that actually sticks within individual uh, agent or individual sectors. And, it, you know, I mean, I don't know, is that what Congress had in mind? Or is that what? Well, I can tell you that's not what the framers had in mind. No. But is uh, is <laughs> but, you know, that's just sort of the way that it works these days. Um, and I think the there some of the, these these incredibly broad statutes, you know, I mean, would Congress today pass a statute that said, well, you know, just and reasonable rates are legal and unjust and unreasonable rates are illegal. There you go. And I don't know, Federal Power Commission yeah. and go figure it out, whatever that means. Um, that, that doesn't really, those New Deal laws like that are, are they're pretty malleable, but, it, but what it means is they can be sort of uh, formed to whatever the current state of, uh, of the economy and technology is. I think we have time for one more question. I'm going to end with an easy one that was in the chat. Um, at least I think it's easy about the culture at FERC. Like, because FERC seems to be an agency, even in the last five years, it hasn't been cleaned out like so many federal agencies. Mm -hmm. And it seems to develop long term leaders who either stay, like the people like Larry Greenfield, who've been there forever and are the mainstays, or go on to very senior roles on the outside. And um, you know, I think everyone is, has a role. You were there for a long time, Betsy. I was there for a long time. What do you think? I mean, that's what we want federal government agencies to be like, right? To actually have dedicated non-political staff that cares about the mission. And um, I'm interested in your thoughts. Um, well, I'm, I'm a big fan of Rich Glick. I'll just let me say that. And I think he has a huge opportunity here. Um, I, I think that uh, um, I haven't talked to him about, you know, what his priorities are or anything like that. It just hasn't been, um, hasn't seemed um, timely for me to do that. But I, I think that uh, in the next swag six months, I think you'll figure out what he wants to take up, what, what he wants to focus on. I think a lot of it is going to be driven by uh, uh, post-Texas stuff, unfortunately. Um, and we'll just have to see where they go. That's not very insightful, but it is what it is. Well, I think he has a huge opportunity too, because too. in a little bit like you, he has two brand new commissioners, another one who's been there less than a year, and there'll be another seat open in a couple months. So he's going to have a new commission. And even anytime you even get one new person, it's a reset. This is like a huge reset. So they're going to this commission, the Biden commission or whatever, is going to be what it's going to be. And we'll find out. David, do Cheryl, you have... I nominate you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> David, did you have any closing thoughts? And then I'll close out. No, thank you very Just to say thank you, Betsy, for joining us today. Very much appreciate it. Um, the changes you brought about when you were at the commission have, uh, have, have uh, endured and, um, and, and really have, uh, I mean, they transformed the industry and I think are a model for how a lot of us can look at what it is that can happen today in the, both in policy in general and particularly in the electricity sector. So thank you for that and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. It was great. I also want to thank Betsy and also all the people who took time out of their day. We know you have a choice of Zoom calls um, <laughs> to listen to this. And I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions in the chat. Um, we will be back together, David and I, in four weeks on March 25th. Um, I had hoped we'd be announcing our guest, but we have not. Um, it looks like we could just take Q&A if we want to do that, but we um, we won't all, we- We might do that. We might yeah, do that. You know, we we do, but we really appreciate people attending and um, we hope you'll join us again. And the cent please look at the Center on Global Energy Policy website for more exciting events that I believe are currently coming up in your chat, if you want to click on a chat. And thank you all very much, especially thank you, Betsy. Thank you, it was fun.